and Calvary covers it all. Isn't that marvelous? An infinite sacrifice at a point in time that covers an infinite multitude of sins. You think of all the people that have ever lived and died. You think how many sins have been committed since that first sin in the Garden of Eden. It had to be an infinite sacrifice. And Calvary covers it all. Have you taken advantage of that? Have you applied the blood of Christ to your sins personally? Calvary covers it all. Please take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 15. Today we're looking at verses 22 through 27. I just realized that since I'm leading the service today and uh, Brother McCoy is not here and he usually does this, uh, we missed the scripture reading. So I'll read it for you now. And that means the prayer hymn also. Choir, I'm very sorry about that. We're in Exodus chapter 15. I'll be reading verses 22 through 27. God's word for his people. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah. For they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree, which, when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them, and said, If Thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elim, where were twelve wells of water, and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will take your word and apply it to our hearts this day. That we might not only have a head knowledge of that which you have done in times past, but that we might have a heart knowledge so that we will understand and know what you expect in terms of obedience. We thank you, Father, for your word and its power, and we pray that you will apply it to our hearts this day, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're at re rebellion test number four. That's the test at re uh, Rephidim, which is a test that's teaching us things about prayer and spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare is a major theme in Scripture. That gave us a starting point so that we could understand what is going on in the world around us today as we look at spiritual warfare. And back on May 6, we started looking at the fourfold division of the angelic military that Paul mentions in that place. And we saw that the first word that Paul uses is the word principalities. That's the first ones. That's the word used by Paul of angels and demons who are invested with power. They're the very top level of the echelons of authority in the angelic realm. And we saw that that word is used by Paul to demonstrate that we are secure. Even the most powerful demons cannot separate you from God's love. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, which is the next word we'll look at, which is exousia, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And we learned five more principles as well, six more principles. In 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Jesus is more powerful than the most powerful demons. In Ephesians 1, 21, the resurrection and ascension guarantees that Jesus is greater than the greatest of the demons. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, the church teaches angels and demons the manifold wisdom of God. Colossians 1, 16, Jesus created even the highest level of angels before they fell and became demons. He's not a created being himself. He is the creator, and he created them as angels before their fall. Colossians 2, verses 10 and 15 tell us that Jesus is higher in authority than the angels and demons, and that Jesus spoiled them all at his cross. And then we saw that Titus chapter 3, verse 1 uses that word arche of human beings who are ordained to governmental power and authority. That's the top level of governmental authorities and power. And here in our country, it's divided into three different branches, but in many countries, the top level authority is simply the king or the dictator. Now, last week, we began our study of the second word, or I should say two weeks ago, uh, we began the study of the word exousia, authorities. That's the word for jurisdictions, the area in which authority is exercised, as in police jurisdiction. And I gave you the illustration of how in Alabama, you'll be driving through the countryside with nothing anywhere around, and you suddenly see a little blue sign on the side of the road that says police jurisdiction. It means that at that point, even though you're still way outside the city limits, that the police from whatever that little town or burg is have the authority to go all the way out to that point and exercise their authority. And from there on, it's the county sheriff who has jurisdiction. So the word that is used here that's translated powers is the word for authority or the scope of jurisdiction. The scope of the authority of Christ was frequently challenged, not merely his ability. Nobody ever really questioned the ability of Jesus after they saw his miracles. When he raised somebody from the dead, they didn't question his ability. But they did question his authority in the things that he taught and sometimes in the things that he did, like his miracles on the Sabbath day, because they had a very pea-brained kind of attitude about the Sabbath. And Jesus made it clear that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Why? Because he's the creator God. <laughs> He's the one that did all the days of creation, one through six, and then rested on the seventh day. Because he is the creator, he has the authority over the Sabbath to do on the Sabbath what he wishes to do, for he is, in fact, the creator. We saw that Jesus has authority to forgive sins over in Matthew chapter 9, verse 6. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power, that's exousia, that's authority, on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. We saw also that Jesus can delegate authority over demons and sickness to others. That's what we saw in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, where Jesus, when he called his 12 disciples, he gave them power, that's exousia, he gave them authority against unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. So authority over demons and authority over sickness. Now let me pause and say something here. The charismatic leaders claim that authority for themselves. When you claim authority that is not rightfully yours, you are in serious trouble with God. And you're also in serious trouble with those who may have authority as well. But Jesus never delegated that authority to anybody after the New Testament period passed away with the death of the last apostle, who was John, as we know from, uh, he wrote the book of Revelation. So that authority has not been passed down today. Those people who are claiming to have authority over demons and sicknesses are either charlatans or they are deluded, or they are demon-possessed and using it to control people. We've studied that a great deal when we looked at the different spiritual gifts. We saw that Jesus used his authority over sickness to prove that he was the Messiah to the religious leaders. This was one of the important things that you see in the Gospels. Whenever Jesus did a miracle, he didn't just do it because he happened to like to do miracles. Jesus performed specific miracles that were prophesied in the Old Testament that would be the signs of the Messiah. And when you saw somebody who was able to do all of these miracles, it demonstrated to you that the Messiah was there. Those were the signs of his first coming. Those are not the signs of his second coming. Matthew chapter 24 and 25 tell us what the signs of his second coming will be like. There are no signs that are necessary before the rapture of the church. But Jesus gives specific signs concerning his second coming. It's not the working of miracles. 
Those specific miracles were prophesied in the Old Testament as the signs of the first coming of the Messiah, and Jesus did every one of the miracles that was necessary for the Messiah to do in order to demonstrate that he was the Messiah. Others had done miracles, like Elijah and so on, but they didn't do all the miracles that were required of the coming Messiah, as well as not fulfilling the other 300 prophecies uh, that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled, like being born of a virgin, being born in Bethlehem, and so on. But Jesus demonstrated through religious leaders, the ones who should have known their Old Testament Bibles, they should have known as they studied the scriptures that these were the miracles that proved Jesus was the Messiah. And he made it clear that he was the Messiah, but they were so power hungry, they were so focused on their own personal power and affluence that they rejected it. And so they denied his authority. That's the challenge to his authority. Jesus used his authority over sickness to prove that he was the Messiah to the religious leaders. We see that in Luke 5, 17. It came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. In other words, he had the whole gamut. There was, it was a big audience full of all the guys who should have known. And the power, the exousia, the authority of the Lord was present to heal them. Jesus was making a point. God saw to it that that day, everybody who should have known better was there to see it. And they challenged him. We see that term exousia has a general use also in the New Testament. It's a word that is used of human authorities over certain jurisdictions, as well as the demons who have been assigned by Satan over certain jurisdictions here on earth. We see that in Luke chapter 12, verse 11. And when they bring you into the synagogues and into the magistrates and powers, Take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what you shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. So here are believers being dragged in front of civil authorities and they're being charged with, you are a Christian. What am I going to say? Don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit will allow you to know exactly what you should say. It may cost you your life, but he'll give you the courage. He'll give you the strength. He will show you what you need to say for the very best testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. You can relax because God is in control. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Do you love God? Are you called according to his purpose? If you're a believer, you are. He has a purpose for your life. Your life will last as long as he wants it to last. And when he wants it to stop, you will die. You cannot avoid the day of your death. You can run from it. You can do all kinds of health stuff. It doesn't matter. You're going to die the day that God has assigned. So if it happens to be as a martyr, rejoice. Because you'll have a great reward in heaven. Never be ashamed of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's with you. Now, no angelic or human authority can separate us from the love of Christ, just like no principality can separate us from the love of Christ. We already read that passage a few moments ago over in Romans chapter 8, and that is the second word that is used in that text, where it says, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, that was our first word, RK, nor powers, that's exousia, nor things present nor things to come. Nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the final thing that we looked at last time was exousia refers to legitimate spheres of jurisdiction as well as demonic spheres of jurisdiction. The term may even refer to authorities that are persecuting Christians and yet they have legitimate, that is supported by law, authority. And we're going to talk a bit about a, a very important passage our, when we start the new material today. Uh, a very important passage that has been confused a lot by Christians who don't want to obey the government. But we see that there are authorities that are supported by law, but that does not mean that they are therefore in compliance with divine law. Just because something is legal does not make it morally right. And I gave you the illustrations last time about abortion or physician-assisted suicide 
or so-called gay marriage. Those things are legal, but they are not morally right. And we gave you the illustration of how Satan gives power, he has exousia, that he gives to the Antichrist. And we saw the three elements of that, of the authority that the devil has, and there are three different words that are used of that in Revelation 13. It says the dragon gave him his power, that's the word dunamis, force, and we'll talk about that later, and his seed and his great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. So there's a counterfeit resurrection. We'll talk about that when we get to Revelation 13. Uh, the wound, the, the deadly wound that was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the beast, uh, worshipped the dragon, which gave authority, a power, that's exousia, to the beast. So there's your source. That's the first thing you learn about authority. It has a source. They worship the beast, saying, who's like the beast? Who's able to make war with him? Then in verse 5, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power, that's exousia, was given unto him to continue 42 months. Authority, exousia, has a time limit to it. So there's got to be a source, there's a time limit to it. He opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, them that dwell in heaven, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power, that is authority, exousia, was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So that's the scope. How far does his authority extend? Remember we talked about police jurisdiction? The local town police only have authority out to those little signs that say police jurisdiction. And then a larger jurisdiction around that is the county, where your county sheriff is in charge and all of his deputies. And then you have, you know, your state jurisdictions, and then you have your federal jurisdictions, which extend all over the place. Three things about authority. Number one, source. Number one, number two, time. Number three, scope. Now that brings us to our study for today. One of the most important passages in the New Testament discussing the issue of authority is Romans chapter 13. It is a very important passage of scripture. Paul was writing during the days of the Roman Empire. Paul was writing during the days when he himself got executed by the Roman Empire. And yet he talks about obedience to authority. This passage tells us why Christians should be in submission to civil authorities in the government. In the first three verses of Romans chapter 13, we find the word exousia, the word, it's translated power, but it's the word that means authority. We find it used five times in three verses. Obviously, this is a rather critical issue in Romans chapter 13. It's not just talking about the power of the government in terms of its force, it's talking about its authority. Five times we find this word is used here. I hope you get the idea the Bible has a lot to say about authority. There are many passages we won't have time to look at, but I'm trying to pick out the key ones that are essential for us to understand. That means that the principles of authority are very important to God. Now in the past you've heard me preach on the chain of command, and you've also heard me preach on the spheres of authority. That is the various jurisdictions, the family, the church, work, and government, and how some of those sometimes overlap with one another. But they are not coterminous. The church doesn't have authority over the government, though the Romans, Roman Catholic institution has tried to do that in many places. And the government doesn't have authority over the church in certain spheres, like in what we believe and the fact that God has commanded us to preach the gospel to the whole world. They don't have authority to stop you from preaching. Now let's look at verse 1 here. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. That's the higher authorities, the higher exousia. For there is no power, that's exousia again, but of God. The powers, that is exousia, three times in one verse. The authorities that be are ordained of God. Now, I hope you write this down because this will help you solve problems when you say, well, we're told to be obedient to government, but the government is telling me to do something that I'm not quite sure the Bible lets me do or forbids me from doing something that I think the Bible commands. There are four things mentioned here in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Four areas 
where the government has authority and only these four areas where the government has authority. You need to write them down. Here are the areas of authority that God has given the government to have. Number one, civil and social order based on the principles of divine law. Civil and social order based on the principles of divine law because it says the ordinances of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. God never ordains something that is outside of divine law. So civil and social order that's based on the principles of divine law. Then we find, whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance, that's the divine law, of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. The government has authority over civil and social order. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou not be then afraid of the power, that is authority, exousia? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. We're dealing with civil and social order based on principles of divine law, the ordinances of God. The second area that God has ordained government to have authority is criminal law and national defense, or we would say war. Criminal law and national defense, that's area number two. And that, by the way, includes capital punishment. We see that from the word sword that he uses in verse four, the mykaira. There's another word for sword, which is only used for battle weapons, but this word here is used for an executioner's sword. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God. God ordained capital punishment back in the book of Genesis. Whoever murders somebody else, by him shall man's blood be shed. God said so very back at the very beginning and all the way through the Old Testament. And it's only the modern liberals who try to get rid of capital punishment. He is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. God has ordained government to be in charge of criminal law and national defense. Number three, third area where government is responsible. Did you know that government is responsible before God for the establishment of a national moral conscience based on divine law in the context of Romans chapter 2. Verse 5, Wherefore you must needs be subject. Why are you subject to government? Not just because you're scared of them, not only for wrath, that was back in verse 4, but he says also for conscience sake. Paul is taking you back to his discussion in Romans chapter 2. You remember there are three ways by which men know God. Romans chapter 1, they know God by the light of creation, so that they are without excuse. Romans chapter 2, they know God because God has given them a conscience, therefore they are without excuse. Romans chapter 3, they know God because God has given divine revelation, specific divine revelation, so that they are all, no matter where they are, no matter how much light they've got, they are all without excuse. He's reminding us of his discussion back in Romans chapter 2. Government is responsible for the upholding of the national moral standards that God established. A national moral conscience. And you know what? Government isn't doing it here in the United States. They've permitted things like gay marriage and they're destroying the national conscience of our country with this chant transgendered garbage that's being pushed out there and they're destroying the conscience of our nation with abortion someday they may tell you like the Chinese government has told their people if you have more than one baby we're going to kill your other babies and euthanasia and all the horrible, perverted things that we see happening in our society, 
Satan is trying to use government to destroy the national moral conscience, which was established by our founders in this country. And the fourth area, which is where most people focus when they read this chapter, is the one that bothers them the most. They don't care about the other ones, but taxation. But Paul spends three verses on taxation, and he'll spend one verse on each of the other areas. Verse 6. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers. Now, did you get that? He said the same thing about government being responsible for criminal law and for national defense. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. He says the same thing about taxation. We want the government to lock the criminals up. The people who run around killing people and selling drugs and all that kind of stuff. If you want them to lock those guys up, you better want them to lock the guys up who are tax evaders too. The people who cheat on their tax. The people who get paid money under the table. The ones who don't want to report it because they say, I earned it, not the government. No, but the government's here to protect you and the government is, up to this point at least, protecting you. The government's paving your roads where you drive your cars and your trucks and your motorcycles and your bicycles and your tricycles if you're little enough. He's the minister of God for taxation. Huh. And you know what? Government spends a lot of time on that. Paul mentions that. He says, attending continually upon this very thing. <laughs> Always looking for new ways to tax you. Always drives me nuts when I drove over into Philadelphia and, you know, I get thirsty and I want to stop at a Wawa or something and buy a, a soda pop and I get that hit with that sweetened beverage tax over there. Oh, <laughs> really kills you. Hey, the government is always looking for ways to tax you, isn't it? You know what? I don't sit out front of those places and protest the sweetened beverage tax. I pay the tax. You know what? It would be stupid to go to jail for not paying a beverage tax, wouldn't it? Render therefore is a command. This is not a suggestion. This is not an alternate option. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Okay, we're talking money there. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. He moves down the ladder into even the levels of respect for people who are in positions of authority. And he's moving from the specific to the general. In other words, that is a general principle. Paul does that, by the way, all the way through the book of Romans. He talks about specifics and then he gives you a general principle. Then he talks about some more specifics in something else, then he gives you a general principle. Then he talks about specifics in something else, then he gives you a general principle. This isn't a principle. This is a general principle that applies to every sphere of authority, not merely to government. It applies in the church. It applies in the home. It applies at work, as well as applying in government. It means we're not to disrespect or talk evil of the ruler of our people, as the Apostle Paul said. He didn't realize he was being spoken to by the high priest. And he corrected himself, saying, God shall smite you, you whited wall. He said, I'm sorry, shouldn't have said that. Paul had respect even to the high priest, who was vilely condemning him and telling the guy standing next to him, hit him in the mouth. We are to have respect for those whom God has put in authority over us in government. At work, you don't talk about your boss behind his back. You don't badmouth him. You don't try to subvert things to make him look bad. You have respect in the home, the one whom God has ordained as the head of the home. Though God gives a, a bigger job to the head of the home. Did you know that? God tells the wives, you know, obey your husbands, submit to them. But he tells the husbands, love your wife in the same manner that Christ loved the church. That's a harder job than merely obeying. And God will hold you husbands accountable for loving your wives in the same manner that Jesus Christ loves the church and gave himself for it. 
How does Jesus love the church? Well, first of all, he was willing to die for it. That's obvious. But does Jesus ever talk disparagingly down at the church? He corrects it. He rebukes it. But only on things where the church has sinned. He speaks words of gentle, gentle tenderness and kindness. That's what all the New Testament is all about. Words of encouragement to the church, words of exhortation to the church, words of love and help and kindness and tenderness. Husbands, is that how you love your wives? Girls, if you marry someday, try to find a man who will love you in the same manner that Christ loves the church. You've got an easy job. All you've got to do is obey him. And who wouldn't obey a man like that? A man who is like the Lord Jesus. I got away from my notes there for a minute. But Paul is dealing with a general principle here, and he moves into a second general principle in verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Moving from specific to general principle. Specific to general principles. Specific to general principles. You'll find that pattern all the way through the book of Romans. Don't owe anything. In fact, that's a triple negative. That's why this is one of the passages that covers the no debt principle. Why you shouldn't be in debt for anything at any time for any reason. Because he has a triple negative here. Don't by any means, no, never at all, never owe anything to anybody for anything. The only debt that you can never pay off is the debt of love. And not only are we to love Christ as he loved us, and not only are husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, but it says we are to love one another. Say that ornery group of people at Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood? Yes. Sometimes I wonder, and I say, Lord, are you sure that applies to me, loving this group of people? No, I know you never thought that that might happen, right? Yes. I have to love you also. That means you have to love me too. That means those of you who disagree with each other on different things, you have to love each other too. You know, a good marriage is where the husband is never criticizing the wife behind her back to somebody else where the wife is never bad-mouthing her husband behind his back to somebody else. They may have intense discussions among themselves about what's the right way to do this for the children or do something else or how to use the resources that God has given, though in the end the husband has the final authority on that. But they do it with honor and respect and with love. Did you know that's how we're supposed to act in the church too? Love one another. There are a lot of different things in the New Testament where it talks about one another. It talks about the relationship between members of the body of Christ, the church. Look up all the one another's sometime in the New Testament. Maybe someday I'll preach a message on all the one another's in the New Testament. But love is key to that. You cannot do any of the one another activities of the New Testament if you don't love one another. And did you know something? It also means that you don't have to worry about the law. He that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. You know, if you love one another, you're not going to steal from another person. You're not going to commit adultery on your wife. You're not going to kill somebody else. You fulfilled the law. If you love the other person, it means you want the best for them. You're not going to covet their stuff, their ox, their ass, their house, or anything else that's our neighbors. Because you're delighted that God gave them something good, even if he didn't give it to you. You don't have to go out and covet it. Romans chapter 13 is rather, rather important, I think. Remember the four areas of authority. Government has civil and social order based on the principles of divine law. Criminal law and national offense, including capital punishment. 
establishment of a national moral conscience and not the violation of a national moral conscience based on divine law, and taxation. And then we have the general principles which go all the way down to how we treat one another, all the way down through honor and finally to love one another. Paul also passes that teaching about obedience to government on to the very next generation of preachers because he writes the same thing to Titus. He shows that it applies to every generation, not just to the first generation of Christians. He also uses two words to describe the believer's response to government. There are two things that we're supposed to do as believers. The four areas that government has authority, the two things that believers are supposed to do in relation to government. So you got four over here, now you got two over here. Here's what government's supposed to do, now here's what you're supposed to do in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The two words that are used of the believer to describe the believer's response to government are, first of all, to be subject. That's to submit. That's passive activity. The passive response of believers to government is to be subject. And then it says, and to obey government. That's the active thing that we do. And then Paul begins to describe what it means to obey. He emphasizes this with the phrase, be ready to every good work. And then he follows with four things, four obligations related to the mouth, to actions, to demeanor, and to attitudes. Now let me read you the passage. We'll go back and look at each of those. Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. And those are our two words. Arche and exuthia. Those are divisions of angelic beings, but those are also divisions of government. So the first thing we have to do is be subject to government. Those of us who have rebellious spirits don't like that idea. But remember, that's subject in the four areas where God has given them authority, like setting speed limits, for example. Government does not violate its authority when it sets a speed limit, even if we don't like the speed limit. Government does not exceed its authority when it puts up detour signs, and we grumble and mumble about it because we don't want to drive out of our way. The four areas of authority include civil and social order. So he says, put them in mind to be subject to arche and exuthia, principalities and powers. Second thing, to obey. Now there's the active one. First one is, is passive, second one is active. To obey magistrates. And then he says, summarizes it up, to be ready to every good work, and then he gives you the four different obligations that relate to your mouth, your actions, your demeanor, and attitudes. Number one, the mouth. To speak evil of no man, that's mouth. Number two, to be no brawlers, you're not participating in all these riots and throwing rocks at the police and all that kind of stuff. But gentle, there's your demeanor. And then he says, showing all meekness unto all men. The word meekness is power under control. That's your attitude. You don't fume and explode. You don't fume and explode. You don't fume and explode. You show meekness. The Bible tells us that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Now, Moses was no milk toast. Moses was a powerful man. But it was power under control. He lost it sometimes. But that was power under control. Powerful man. Just like God teaches the archangels angels and demons his wisdom as he deals with the church, he also teaches those angels at the exousia level, both angelic and demonic, his wisdom in the church, those who have been signed to all the different heavenly jurisdictions. Remember, we saw that both over in chapter 3 of Ephesians, but I want to make a comment on another verse there. So let's start in verse 9. Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verse 9. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now, Paul had been talking about the mystery. You've heard me preach on the mysteries in the New Testament. There are 17 different mysteries in the New Testament. But the mystery of the church, which was not revealed in the Old Testament, was that Jews and Gentiles should be placed together in one body. That's what he talks about in the first three verses of Ephesians chapter 3. So he's still talking about the same thing when we get down to verse 9. That God did not reveal in in the ages that were past, you know, that God was going to join together Jew and Gentile into one body, which is called the church. 
So that's what he's talking about here in verse 9. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, that's Jews and Gentiles in the same body, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So here's something that God did not reveal in the Old Testament. He only revealed it in the New Testament. It was hidden, but God revealed it. Something that used to be covered now is revealed. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. Another statement of Jesus Christ as a creator, Genesis chapter 1. Through the intent that now unto the principalities, that's the arche and powers, exousia, in heavenly places might be known by the church of God, the manifold wisdom of God. So God not only taught the top guys this lesson, but God also taught every demon that's over every jurisdiction anywhere on earth his wisdom by the way he's dealing with the church today. That should boggle your mind because God, by revealing his wisdom, also reveals his purpose. That's verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'm going to try to cover at least one more. We've got four minutes. Exousia is also used to speak of the authority of darkness as opposed to light. The authority of darkness. Did you know darkness has a sphere of authority? Christ is the light who breaks the darkness. But without Christ, darkness has authority over every human being. So darkness is used both literally in the scriptures to speak of night and day. That's what you see in Genesis 1. But darkness is also used figuratively to speak of spiritual darkness and spiritual light that Jesus provides. We see this over in the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. In verses 13 and 16, I'm going to start reading at verse 12. Giving thanks unto God the Father, uh, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So here he starts off with us. We're inheriting with all the saints in light. And then we see verse 13, where God drew, drew us from. Who hath delivered us from the exousia, the power of darkness, from the authority of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. That's a special word there that's used to show that he is over all of creation. He's not a creature himself. For, and explains that in verse 16. For by him were all things created. Jesus made everything. Not just stuff on earth. Everything that's created in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, that means you and me, which we can see, and the demons and the angels, which we can't see, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities. There's arche. That's that first word that Paul talked about in the echelon of the demonic authorities. Or powers. That's, exus uh, that's, uh, that's uh, exousia. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. In other words, Jesus is God. He was before anything was ever created, and he made it all, both in the physical realm and in the spiritual realm. And the word consist means to hold together. Do you know why we don't blow apart? Scientists have wondered about that. What's the nuclear glue that keeps everything from blowing up like an atomic bomb? Jesus, it says, is the one who holds everything together holds all the atoms together so that we don't all just disintegrate it's marvelous to think about that and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead the first one to rise from the dead with a permanent resurrection body all the rest of those who rose from the dead for example in the old testament or that jesus raised from the dead during the gospels they all died again that in all things he might have the preeminence the preeminence. That means he's always first in line. He's always at the head. When the armies of Jesus come back from heaven, he's not going to be riding in the rear and driving us on with whips. He's going to come first. He has the preeminence. He has the right to the throne. He has the right to the title. He has the right to worship. He has the preeminence in everything that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness 
dwell. And he explains that in Colossians 2, 9. One chapter later, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians is a great book for proving the deity of Christ. Paul makes multiple theological statements to that effect throughout the book. Now our time is up, but there are several things here in the Colossians passage, Lord willing, that's where we'll start next week, that come out of Genesis 1 and out of John chapters 1 through 3. Because the concept of time, the concept of time itself originally started with the separation of light from darkness. And in eternity future, in the heavenly Jerusalem, there will be no night there. That light and darkness is what brings us into the idea of time when we're back in Genesis. Oh, there's a lot to say about that, but we'll have to close at this point. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is very clear and demonstrates to us that Jesus Christ is indeed our God and Savior, our Redeemer. That in the spiritual warfare, which is what Rephidim is all about, it teaches us the basic principles of that. There are many levels within that war, different spheres of authority, as well as different levels of power, and yet the one who is our commander-in-chief is the Lord of all, and before him every knee will bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, I also pray that today we will have understood what are the spheres of authority of human government even though sometimes they step outside of that sphere of authority. And when they do so, it may cost Christians their lives, as it does in many countries around the world. For we rebel not against our human authorities, but we obey the higher authority to stand and testify for Jesus, no matter what the con consequences are. And so, Father, once again, we thank you for your word and for its power, and we pray for your blessings upon it to our hearts, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.